Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to give it a couple of minutes here to get everyone into the meeting. Good afternoon again, everyone. We'll give it another minute or minute and a half here to get everyone into the meeting. Good afternoon again, everyone. We'll give it one more minute. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on My Life, Our Future Research Repository. My name is Brett Spitali, and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will post to our presenter at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, March 19th. I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Jill, Jill Johnson, who is an associate member at Bloodworks Research Institute and an associate professor of medicine, division of hematology at the University of Washington. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, Dr. Johnson, and I will now turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really privileged to be speaking. So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, my life, our future and research potential and uh, a project I'm doing in the research repository. Very briefly, uh, these are my disclosures, which have no relevance to today's presentation. So what I'm gonna to talk today is about the potential for My Life, Our Future to enable research to better understand bleeding and factor level variation in hemophilia genetic carriers, which are female. So first I'm gonna talk about a little bit about what are the considerations in females with inherited bleeding disorders in the first place then talk a little bit about uh, what we understand about hemophilia carriers now and how we use language to talk about them. We'll talk about My Life, Our Future genotyping program, and then how that uh, provides a research resource to the community and how that can enable this kind of research to go forward and some preliminary results from what we've done so far. So first, considerations in females with inherited bleeding disorders. This is a really challenging area. Uh, part of it's just because of bleeding disorders in, in general, they are very challenging because there's variable bleeding. And then there's also a variation in what we call penetrance and expressivity, which is how many people who've inherited um, the genetic change that causes disease have the disease. And expressivity is how many people who have the disease have severe or mild forms of it. So whether or not you're bleeding or not bleeding is not a binary phenotype. It's not, yes, I bleed, no, I don't. Uh, normal people have bleeding, especially with traumas, for example. And um, there are some people with bleeding disorders who are not have bleeding and essentially no one is bleeding all the time. So it's quite a spectrum to say, when does someone have a bleeding disorder or not? And how severe is it based upon symptoms? And this gets even harder in females because of female reproductive tract bleeding. This poses unique challenges in part because we don't have a male comparator um, to, uh, to assign severity. And it's also really hard to measure how much bleeding is a woman having in, it was from uh, endometrial, uterine, or ovarian bleeding. There are also systemic biases that oppose a challenge for women and girls who are seeking medical care there are delays in diagnosis. Um, and even in, with a diagnosis, there can be delays in under treatment and delivering care that they need to treat bleeding. These are the same barriers that pose barriers to research as well. 
There's also uh, female biology around hormones and factor levels. We use, we rely upon the factor levels pretty heavily to make diagnoses, and we're going to talk a little bit more about factor levels later. But that variation also makes it hard to pin down who's having bleeding, not bleeding, who has factor high or low factor levels. Another consideration is how bleeding disorders are inherited. Now, for a bleeding disorder like von Willebrand disease, the von Willebrand factor gene is on what we call an autosome, and everyone has two copies of an autosome um, for the most part. Um, in hemophilia, the, the genes that um, uh, encode factor, factor eight and factor nine are on the X chromosome. And so in, this is an inherent difference um, based upon biological sex, where most males have an X and an Y and only have one copy of their factor gene, while females usually have two copies of the X chromosome and have two copies. So this also poses differences in how um, it, um, bleeding disorders are inherited in, he in hemophilia and also how they present in hemophilia. Um, and there's been a long-standing belief for some time that X-linked disorders uh, really only cause disease in males. And it hasn't been until recently that the medical community has recognized that females have disease too. Um, but that narrative has uh, posed also a high barrier to women getting diagnosed, um, getting treated, and having research to better understand their bleeding. So here's the textbook introduction to hemophilia A and B. And this is important to understand. This, is, this, is, this describes hemophilia A and B in males. And this is the language we use to describe all of hemophilia. So hemophilia, these are these rare excellent disorders as we just discussed. A hemophilia A is deficiency in factor eight encoded by the factor eight gene. And hemophilia B is a deficiency in factor nine encoded by the factor nine gene. Hemophilia patients have bleeding in joints and soft tissue and also with traumas and surgeries. And the severity of disease is defined actually by the laboratory factor activity level with severe disease being uh, less than 1% detectable factor activity level, moderate disease being one to 5% activity and mild disease being greater than 5% but still low. Um, and it's important to remember that the factor level is what we use to talk about severity in hemophilia because although the factor level in males pretty well correlates with bleeding, it does not perfectly correlate with bleeding. We all know patients with moderate disease who have bleeding like a patient with severe hemophilia. And we also all know patients with moderate disease who have bleeding like a mild hemophilia patient. Um, and, um, and in fact, you know, there are some patients with severe disease who have not a lot of bleeding for their levels and mild patients can have severe bleeding too. So we use the levels to talk about severity, but it does not always correlate one-to-one -one with how bad their bleeding is in males. And we have to remember that that's how we're describing the disorder in females too. So factor levels in female genetic carriers of hemophilia. So these are women who've, in, who've inherited um, a gene copy of factor eight um, that um, causes hemophilia in a male. And you can see that on the right, the lighter green, we have this um, spectrum of factor eight levels. This, this curve of factor eight levels is what we've seen in the normal population. Um, and so it's you know, about 100 is in the middle. Um, and, um, and there are some women who will have levels down as low as 50. Um, uh, but in hemophilia carriers, this curve looks about the same, but is shifted to the left to lower levels. So you can see that instead of the middle of the curve being 100, the middle of the curve is about 50. And then there's a wide range of levels spanning to levels that no one would argue are in the range of hemophilia. Um, and so these levels are important to remember um, because again, levels don't always correlate with bleeding in males. And um, we're gonna talk in a little bit that they correlate even less with bleeding in females. But these factor levels are what you would expect when you go from having two working copies of a gene to one working copy of a gene. So the low levels here would be probably 30 to 40, um, but less than 50. And then everyone agrees with a hemophilia diagnosis under 30 and some under 40. Um, and so this low factor eight level becomes an ambu ambiguous area uh, for defining hemophilia. And then we still have people in the, in the low normal range that is common. 
So we use genetics um, in hemophilia for lots of reasons, and this is going to lead into also um, what we've done in My Life, Our Future. And we use hemophilia genetics because the genotype informs reproductive planning, pregnancy and neonatal management. It can predict the risk of inhibitors. It can predict disease severity. Um, and it can also really help us understand what causes hemophilia in the first place. And it's a high yield test to do. Um, the genetic, genetic testing finds um, in My Life or Future, we found that over 98% of patients had an identifiable causative variant in the gene that we think causes their disease. Um, and despite this, in 2012, only 20% of US patients with hemophilia had a genotype. And the genotype is going to become so important later on because this is the one test that really firmly establishes whether or not a female is a carrier. So let's talk about the inheritance of hemophilia in A and B and what it means to be an X-linked disorder. So this is the old cartoon, which infers that I'm going to tell you what I think it should be changed to, of what it means to be X-linked uh, recessive. And this is what has been taught in hemophilia over the years. So we have this genotype, like what we just discussed, that's very useful to know about. And so we know there's a genetic change on, let's say this is mom, who's a carrier. And according to the old definition, she has no medical condition um, and has an X chromosome with one non-working gene. So that's like our hemophilia gene. And dad um, does not have the condition. And so mom has a 50% chance to pass along either of these chromosome, X chromosomes to her kids. So half the kids will get the working gene version and half the kids will get the non-working gene version. So um, as you can see, um, the Y chromosome from dad, he has a 50% chance to pass on either of these. So half the kids will be female because he gives an X and half will be male because he gives a Y. And so if you look at the boys, um, then they have a 50% 50 uh, 50 chance of the, uh, to have inherited the hemophilia causative gene. So um, of the boys, half of them will have hemophilia and half will not. And these boys have been the primary focus of the diagnostic testing, the prenatal testing, and, um, and uh, where we look for disease in the family. And that's because males only have one copy and tend to have much more severe forms of hemophilia than females. Um, so that has meant in the past with this view that mom is a carrier and has no condition and that a carrier does not have a condition, females have only been tested as the relatives of males with disease. So let's talk about what it means to use the word carrier. In our area where we are in bleeding disorder circles, when we say carrier, we just mean female. We don't really mean to convey whether or not she has bleeding. We use other modifiers of that. We'll say she's asymptomatic or she's symptomatic as a carrier. But in medical genetics, the definition of a carrier is really quite different. And that is that a carrier of any disorder is an individual who has a disease causing gene change in one copy of a gene, but does not have the genetic disease related to the abnormal gene. So for most of medicine, when a bleeding disorder person talks to a medical geneticist who doesn't know about our specific disorders, or um, we talk to um, another, another um, routine medical provider, if we say carrier, they're hearing no disease condition because that's the medical definition of a carrier. And so that's where saying symptomatic carrier makes no sense to someone outside of our field. And it's important to remember that hemophilia carriers are often actually symptomatic with bleeding, and this has been under-recognized until recent years. So approximately one in four women will have a high bleeding score on a bat. Um, both providers and patients report um, ascertaining excessive bleeding and reduced quality of life in, in women who are genetic carriers. They have radiographic joint structural changes, and the, the, they have excessive mucocutaneous bleeding, which is not the canonical pattern of hemophilia. Remember, in males, we're talking about joint and soft tissue bleeding. Um, and importantly, bleeding is only weakly associated with a factor level. And in fact, female genetic carriers can have excessive bleeding even when their factor levels are in what is um, outside of hemophilia considered to be the low normal range. 
One thing that does seem to be associated with higher bleeding scores is a poor response to DBAVP, but that's not something we have a lot of data on for these women most of the time. So I think the real question is, do we continue to call females who have genetic changes in their genes causing hemophilia as carriers in the first place? And we certainly shouldn't call it recessive because X-linked recessive inheritance in hemophilia and potentially other X-linked disorders is probably not really a thing because if a female can have disease, it's not recessive. So if we change this view to say, it's no, not an excellent recessive disorder that a mother who's heterozygous, meaning she has one copy of the gene um, that causes the disease, um, can have the disease, then we say, well, the mom may or may not have the condition. And then you really need testing of all of these people to determine who's at risk. So we need to know about mom status, we need to know about the boys, and we need to know about the girls because the girls may also be in the position of having or not having the condition. So um, in that case, we would say if we test all the kids, 50%, both uh, the boy and the girl who inherit this uh, genetic change should be identified because the girl also needs to be evaluated to determine if she's at high risk of bleeding. And importantly, we've probably been missing many, many women who are what we call symptomatic carriers because of all the biases we just discussed, that the levels aren't predicting the bleeding um, and also systemic biases um, for women and girls um, uh, to delay diagnosis and care. So it's important to think, well, how many people are we missing? And we say for every male with hemophilia, there's over two and a half females at risk and one and a half genetic carriers. So there really is a need for research into the causes of bleeding and also to better understand factor levels in female genetic cares of hemophilia. And there's multiple plausible contributors to this bleeding, but the evidence is really conflicted or lacking as to what's causing the problem. So one thing we know they all have is the hemophilia genotype, but we don't actually know much about what the type of DNA change that they've inherited contributes to um, uh, discordant factor levels or different kinds of bleeding. We also know they have two X chromosomes and, uh, and we'll discuss this in a minute, but one of these is inactivated in the cells. Um, and so maybe, um, and we know that there are examples where this inactivation can become skewed. So we really need to know um, what has each individual person done with their X chromosome inactivation. We know there's a lot of other modifiers of bleeding that cause variation. So we would need to consider both genetic and environmental factors. And this problem with the factor activity level of really not predicting bleeding really warrants um, further investigation. And one thing to consider is these factor activity levels were really made to make the diagnosis in males um, and haven't been examined for what happens to uh, expression of abnormal uh, gene products uh, in the presence of a normal gene. So that brings us to the opportunity in my life, our future. Uh, my life or future has has had big goals, and it's a it was a national program that um, for the hemophilia, hemophilia community to offer free genotyping to people with hemophilia in their families. That was the main goal, and uh, it was open from 2012 to 2017 uh, to do this. And the goal is to help improve hemophilia care by increasing understanding of these disorders and to build a foundation of the scientist for the scientific breakthroughs of tomorrow. My Life, Our Future is a partnership of AFIN, the American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network, Bloodworks, the National Hemophilia Foundation, with uh, funding and scientific advice from Biogen BioVerative. And of course, what enabled this to be done in a rare disorder is the existence of the Hemophilia Treatment Center networks, and it was done in collaboration with a large number of hemophilia treatment centers. The research repository continues now and is supported by a partnership of Athen, NHF, and Bloodworks. So here is the enrollment of My Life, Our Future over time. Um, and by December 2017, when enrollment was complete, over 11,000 subjects enrolled and over 9,000 consented to participate in research. I'm gonna describe the MLOF genotyping approach. 
because that's important to understanding what we do and don't know about the genetics of the subjects in my life or future. So first, everyone was screened with a custom next generation sequencing panel that sequenced both the factor eight and five factor nine genes simultaneously. Uh, the parts of the genes that were targeted were the coding regions, so the exons, the proximal slice, and your introns, the, UT the UTRs, and the promoter region. Uh, candidate variants were confirmed in the CLIA-approved laboratory. Uh, we interpreted the significance of the DNA variants that were found, and we clinically reported the variants back to the hemophilia treatment centers, and the HTC returned results to patients. Uh, we previously published the findings in the first 3,000 patients, um, and the next, uh, the, the total program publication should be coming out this year. Um, and similar uh, in, in both is that over 98% of, of participants, we found a likely causative variant um, uh, that was reportable. Um, and interestingly, we found a high proportion of novel variations, meaning they had never been found in either in hemophilia in both genes. Um, and so uh, what this said to us is, first of all, genotyping is highly effective in identifying the genetic causes of disease, but also that there's a large number of genetic vari uh, variants out there that can cause hemophilia that had not yet been seen before, and there are probably many more still that we have not seen. And one piece of evidence of this is that we found these novel variants continuously as subjects enrolled. Um, and, uh, and this continued, although trailed off a little bit towards the end of the project, probably because we were seeing, seeing some relatives. So there's no, probably no time where we would have found every possible genetic change that could cause hemophilia. And it's definitely worth every individual patient getting their own genotype. Despite having this high success rate, there was still about one and a half percent of patients with no potentially causative variant found. 44 in hemophilia A and 4 in hemophilia B, and this pattern continued in the project. Uh, and some of these are probably low factor eight patients who may have von Willebrand disease, and there were a few subjects who were diagnosed after having no variant found in their factor eight gene. Um, but some of these, it's because probably the, the genetic cause of the disease was outside of the regions of the genes we were looking at. We also found multiple variants in, um, in some subjects, including 10 females in the first 3,000. And this has big implications in women and girls, uh, one of which is disease severity, because if they have two variants, um, then they're more likely to have severe disease. And the question is, which chromosome are they on? Are they on two opposite chromosomes, or are they on the same chromosome? And that also has implications for how she's going to pass on hemophilia in her family. And who else is at risk in her family that she's related to? Because those chromosomes will separate uh, during meiosis, um, during reproduction. So what's the opportunity in my life or future? We had this great response from the community in participation and a high rate of, of subjects who generously consented to research. And that included many females. So over 2,700 females consented to research and two thirds of them are confirmed to be genetic carriers in my life or future. And there are, are linked clinical elements in, in the app and data set that further enrich my life or future. So of course, um, we knew about their, their um, self-reported sex, their um, at-risk diagnosis, whether or not they would be hemophilia A or B in the family. We know their age. Um, they, we also, uh, HTC uh, reported their baseline factor level. Um, and almost 80% of the carriers have recorded a factor level. Additionally, um, BAT scores were provided for many of the subjects. And you know, although there's incomplete data, there's a little bit of data and asking about treatment, which can be a, a surrogate for bleeding. So this provides the basis to begin research um, in a large scale cohort of female genetic carriers of hemophilia. The My Life or Future Research Repository has biological samples, and many of these patients obviously had DNA, DNA for genotyping, and also um, they are being submitted for whole genome sequencing in the NHLBI TopMed project. Many of them will have RNA, and many of them also provided a plasma sample. And um, there are some subjects who consented to allow linking to relatives, so in some cases we have larger family units to enable um, research. 
So uh, in My Life, Our Future, what we have is a large cohort of females um, who've given us uh, some information on their factor levels, some information on their bleeding via the BAT score. And we really have a great, very well curated group as far as the hemophilia genotype because it was done in the central laboratory with the same method. Um, and so the type of DNA change can now be studied as, an, as a risk factor for female bleeding. So I wanna briefly talk about how do we talk about the genetics? Um, so we're all using the same language. So a single nucleotide variant or SNV is what we mean when a DNA sequence is changed at a single position relative to the reference. So in this example, we have a single nucleotide change where uh, the reference is a T and it has changed to an A. So the, what's a reference sequence in the first place? A reference sequence is a DNA sequence that we've all agreed is going to be our common roadmap to the genome. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's normal, but it's a consensus um, genetic sequence that we all use to say this is what the human genome can look like, and we all can use this to say we're all talking about the same position in the sequence in the same way, and we all agree that this A is a change from a T. Um, similarly, you can be missing some DNA sequences, some nucleotides, or gaining some, um, and these are called deletions or insertions, and that's just a difference in, relative to the reference. And most of the time, um, they're, they're of little clinical significance because they happen outside of important gene regions. And so because of that, we often just call them indels for insertion and deletion. And indels can be small, like this example of a couple of base pairs, but they can also be very large, where we lose a big chunk of the genome or gain a big chunk of the genome relative to the reference. When they're very big, there's something called structural variants because they're changing the structure of the genomic context of that region. And so we have big insertions and deletions. Um, one specific kind of insertion is a duplication. We sometimes talk about that as copy number variation. And then sometimes we can actually take a big chunk of the genome and flip it around the other way, and that's called an inversion. Now, inversions are particularly important in hemophilia because inversions that impact the factor VIII gene account for nearly half of severe hemophilia A cases. So really this entire range of uh, genetic variation is important technically in the lab to be able to detect accurately in order to do um, high um, fidelity hemophilia genotyping. So in MLOF, we knew about these recurring inversions, um, and we know uh, what regions of the gene we're most interested in capturing. So the next generation sequencing screen, as we said before, captures the coding region splice sites, the upstream and downstream regions, and then also we used a molecular trick I'm going to show you in a minute to um, detect the recurring known factor VIII intron 1 and intron 22 inversions. Uh, things were uh, confirmed in the CLIA lab, and if no variant was found, um, in the next gen screen, we then looked again. We did um, manual finger sequencing. We did the factory inversion PCRs. And we also did MLPA to look for other evidence of copy number and structural variation. Um, and so these are the, this is the extent of the data. We basically have thrown every tool we have in the lab at these genes to find uh, the, gene, the causative genotype, uh, although it is, there are certain regions of the genome that we don't see this way. So here's the next generation screen. Um, we used a trick called molecular inversion probes. So the, the probe has um, some business ends. Um, so basically, they're almost like primers, oligo oligonucleotides um, that are um, designed to tile the gene. So we have sort of a five prime and three prime, here's the little blue and red tags with a link or backbone, which is gray. And these anneal to the genetic sequence of interest. So we've tiled the regions that we um, uh, computationally determined we want to sequence. And then we also have custom MIPS that are designed to see the inversion. So in this case, those inversions are very far away from each other in, in the distance in the genome, so we needed a trick. So the trick was to use a restriction enzyme to digest the DNA and then recircularize it. And what happens when you recircularize it is you create a new sequence at the cut site. And that sequence at the cut site can, is indicative of whether or not you have a wild type sequence with no inversion, or when the inversion is present, it comes together and makes new sequences 
that are indicative of the presence of the factor eight intron one or intron 22, intron 22 inversion. So what we could do is we could combine regular DNA with this ligated and recircularized DNA, put it together with our custom MIPS, and all together these MIPS will come together, they'll sit down on their DNA sequences that match, um, and we will fill in the sequence from the, from the subject, get rid of the backbones and barcode, and all this can be pulled together so that we have a highly efficient, high throughput sequencing strategy with multiple people getting sequenced at once. And that's what enabled my life or future to go forward. And then once we found candidate variants computationally, um, we would confirm it in the CLIA laboratory with a second um, method and return the results. And this enabled us to sequence both the factor eight and the factor nine gene, and then to also simultaneously always be looking for the inversion. So, uh, so we had this genetic information just on the factor eight and factor nine genes. And for this project, we're gonna come back to the importance of what we can and can't see with that method, because there are other ways to sequence. And one of them is called whole genome sequencing, um, which my life or future is also getting for subjects who participated in the research repository. So this is just fantastic because NHLBI is enabling as a resource for my life or future to, enjoy, to join the other heart, lung, and blood cohorts um, for whole genome sequencing to enrich our resources and enable future discovery. So in top med phase two, over 2,100 samples were accepted. In phase three, another 2,900. And both of these phases have now completed their whole genome sequencing. So about 5,000 subjects are currently sequenced. And in top med phase six, they generously agreed to sequence the rest. And also new, they have also accepted RNA um, for RNA sequencing from about 4,500 subjects. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of the work we've done in, in the phase two whole genome sequencing data, which, we, is, which is the sequence we've had the longest and had a chance to um, take a look in. And this sequence set was really biased towards mild, moderate, I mean, I'm sorry, against mild and moderate disease because more towards severe disease because one thing we were really clear that we needed to know is what causes severe disease and also um, to enable research on inhibitor development, which is more common in severe disease. So in my life, our future, um, what we wanted to do um, for our, our making sure we haven't missed anything is to consider what kind of genetic changes might we miss with the my life or future genotyping approach. And one of those is structural variation. So let's remember what structural variation is again. So we have uh, small changes, um, the SNVs are very small insertions and deletions. And then structural variants are the big changes, where there's a big insertion or big deletion or a duplication or the, the sequence is flipped around in an inversion. So um, both our next-gen approach in My Life or Future and also whole genome sequencing are very good at finding these small variants. But these large structural variants are actually very hard to see. And that's because we, we capture our sequencing in small chunks um, for technical reasons. And we don't often, it's very hard to, um, see a long, uh, a long chunk of genomic region with the current whole genome sequencing methods, although longer sequencing methods are, are becoming more feasible and available. So we hypothesized maybe some structural variants are what we were missing in our unsolved cases of hemophilia A in the clinical genotyping program. Maybe the research repository is a place to understand what genetic variation might be missing in hemophilia. So. Um, we had 1,961 My Life for Our Future subjects with whole genome sequencing data available, and we really focused in on these patients with severe disease. So these aren't going to be patients that have von Willebrand disease. These are going to be patients that absolutely have hemophilia A. Um, there's, we have probably missed something at their factor 18. And so we looked at them with specialized computational tools for structural variant analysis. Um, using multiple different algorithms to see if we could find structural variation that we may have missed and in my life or future, um, but can be discovered in whole genome sequencing. And in fact, we did find some structural variants solving six of the 11 cases um, with severe hemophilia A. 
And so here are, is a list of the previously unsuspected structural variants. And you can see the type of, this is just where they are in the genome. Um, but you can see the type here, we, we missed a big deletion, but most of the ones we missed that were detected are inversions. Um, they had multiple lines of evidence that supported that they were real. And um, one of them we found in three different subjects. Um, each of these validated with orthogonal methods in our laboratory. And I want to show you a picture of what one of these looks like. So this is what an IGB uh, screenshot looks like, which is a viewer to be able to see whole genome sequencing data. And on the bottom, what you see is a normal, a normal screenshot of, of a sequencing region. So um, where we are in the gene is in, the, is in the schematic at the bottom. And what you can see is the factor eight gene goes from right to left. And here um, we have this large blue box. That's the last exon and then the long UTR the intergenic region, and then the next gene over, which is SNU9. Importantly, in a sample with no structural variation, you have many of these little tiny gray boxes. Each of those are individual sequencing reads. They are aligned to our reference, the consensus sequence that we all agree, so we all know where we are. And then this is their coverage at the top, this little um, topography map looking thing, the, the, gray, the gray hills and valleys, shows kind of fairly even coverage in their sequence everywhere. So now we look up to our three subjects where um, our computational tools identified an inversion. And first of all, you can see that there are big chunks of sequence that are missing in this almost, almost identical region in all three subjects in two places. And you can also see that uh, the final exon of factor eight is there, as is the UTR. So that makes sense that we didn't see this because all of the structural variation is happening in regions that we weren't analyzing in the My Life, Our Future clinical genotyping approach. Interestingly, when we looked, we have this island of sequence here in the middle that's containing the, the, the three prime end of the gene. It turns out that the reads on this side actually map over here into SMIM9, and the distal reads actually map into the middle of factor eight. These are actually facing the other way. So this is an example of a structural variation where we have a chunk of genetic information that's flipped around facing the other way. And when the genome made that mistake, it looks like it made some deletions too when it tried to put the whole thing back together. So this is an inversion that not only impacts factor eight, but also the adjacent gene MIM9. So we used this, which was found in three males, to create a custom PCR that we used to validate the structural variation, but that then became a tool that we could look at females in the family who also had no detectable variant um, uh, that, that was um, causing their hemophilia. And we used this and we used this custom test and we did in fact identify female genetic carriers that were relatives of these um, three men who turned out to be first cousins. Um, so this is a family, um, pro probably private variant, um, and an example of, of the kind of structural variation that can really confound our clinical testing. And I have no doubt we have missed many kinds of variants like this, um, and even potentially in cases where we think that we've solved them by finding a small variant, there could be large variants that we have not yet technically been able to see. We also are studying um, X chromosome inactivation. So this is enabled in uh, through the TopMed program as well. Um, and remember, we're going to have all this RNA sequencing. So we've done a pilot study now to say, well, in the women with hemophilia, um, are we able to use both the RNA and the DNA together in what's called a multiomics approach to uh, better assess X chromosome inactivation in female genetic carriers of hemophilia? So um, we call X chromosome inactivation XCI. So first, very briefly, what is XCI in the first case? Because many of us aren't thinking about this most of the time. So XCI is the transcriptional silencing of one X chromosome in female cells, in any cell that has two X chromosomes. Um, there are exceptions to how many chromosomes people have, and there is an example where there can be males that have an XXY, and this happens in that male cell too. But so, so for the most part, this is a female phenomenon. And the reason is we have our cells expect one dose of the X chromosome. These genes on the X chromosome are busy transcribing and making their gene products. 
and our, our genes are not set up to have a double dose in females and half and a one dose in males. So basically what happens is in a female cell early in development, in uh, the X chromosome is turned off on one copy or the other, the, the mom's copy or the dad's copy. And overall it should happen somewhat stochastically. So, and so that's about half the cells that come out of this process and divide and make all of us. Um, we're kind of like little mosaics where some of our, some regions of us are, have the mom's X chromosome active and some regions of us, we have the dad's X chromosome inactive. And that's what leads to that bell-shaped curve of about 50% factor levels in women who are genetic carriers of hemophilia. But remember, we have that wide skewing. So we know that this process doesn't always work out to be balanced. Sometimes pretty much all, well, not all, but pretty much most of, of, the, of the, the mom's gene may be silenced or maybe the only one that's active. And that really can impact what is, uh, what is the expression of the hemophilia version of the gene in a female. So that's why we want to know about XCI. Um, if we're going to better understand um, bleeding and factor levels in females who are genetic carriers, we have to assess XCI pretty much uh, early on in the game. So we did a pilot to say, can we use the data that's being developed in TopMed to assess XCI in my life or future? Um, we had 161 females. Um, we got a pilot study from the, the, uh, from the BBI, uh, which is an institute here at the University of Washington, to do this pilot. Um, and we had 161 females, and we also used 35 male relatives to develop RNA-seq data on 196 subjects. And then this was paired with whole genome sequencing data um, from 23 females who had already gone through those early phases of top med. Most of the females are coming in this next phase. Um, and so then we look to see, can we measure XCI skewing by counting the number of RNA-seq reads aligned over regions of the genome where she has um, a single base pair change. So that she, um, these are, this means she's heterozygous. And so that would indicate whether a read um, can align to one chromosome or the other chromosome. And so because this is the RNA, this is the transcription of the gene, this is how turned on is the gene, we can say, what is the balance of that heterozygosity at, across the X chromosome? And we can see, is it skewed heavily towards um, it, um, mostly expressing one SNV over another? And we can estimate X chromosome inactivation that way. And so here's our preliminary findings in which we find this is, um, the way this is set up is sort of 50% would be what you'd expect if everything were perfectly balanced in XCI. And then as you move left, they are more and more skewed. And we see a wide range of skewing in these females. And, and then unexpectedly to us, we saw a female who was essentially 100% um, expressing one X chromosome and not expressing any of the other one. And she had severe hemophilia A. So this XCI finding probably explains her severe hemophilia A. It's probably not that we've missed a genotype on the other chromosome. Other early work that we are just now starting now is to investigate other modifiers of bleeding. And so this is, again, where TopMed data can be used, brought to bear to look at other genes that are known to be modifiers of bleeding, and also to study plasma in the My Life Art Future Research Repository for other uh, candidate modifiers like von Willebrand factor. And of course, we're also using these plasma levels to better understand factor activity. I mean, some, uh, some females have excessive bleeding, but normal reported baseline factor levels. And one possibility is our test is just not correlating to our bleeding. So we're starting studies of plasma activity levels with different assays to look for correlation with genotype and bleeding. And for that, I really want to thank HTRS Mid-Career Mid Award for supporting this work um, that we are just starting now. And so taken together, you can see that we have formidable tools to be able to begin to tackle what are the causes of factor level variability and bleeding variability in genetic carriers of hemophilia, because we have really crisp genotype data. We have TopMed as a resource to understand what might the clinical genotype not have seen. We have new approaches to assess X chromosome inactivation, which is absolutely critical in any X-linked disorder study of females. 
We have the ability to look at other modifiers and we have the ability to stutter factor activity level in biological samples. And so this is super exciting, not only for genetic carriers of hemophilia, but these resources are available for all kinds of research in hemophilia. And so that is the value of this MLOF research repository is that we can continue to con make these rich data sets to go ask any other number of interesting questions in hemophilia. And I am really excited to be able to tackle this for females. And appreciate absolutely everyone who participated in my life for a future and made it a success. Um, it could not have been done without patients and their families affected by hemophilia. So just thank you. Um, hemophilia Treatment Center providers and staff went above and beyond, and then many people at the partners, including the National Hemophilia Foundation and Athen. Um, the University of Washington has been critical both in the initial genotyping screen, but now in the analysis of whole genome sequencing and top med. And of course, Barbara Conkle was the PI of My Life for Future here at Bloodworks and led the central lab where it was a privilege to serve and work. Um, and lots of thanks to NHLBI. Um, for uh, HGRS, the Washington Center for Gluten Disorders, um, uh, and Bloodworks for supporting all this work that is helping the research repository go forward. And with that, um, I'm hoping you have a lot of questions because I would love to answer them. Great. Thanks so much, Joe. We appreciate that. And we do have several questions that came in and um, I will get started here. Um, first question is, do you recommend, and if so, how long do you recommend, or how young do you recommend that girls are genetically tested for hemophilia if their mother is a known carrier? Um, so the question is when to test um, when the mom's a known carrier. And I, I think that genetically we can test them if we're gonna sample a cord blood. Um, and then um, if we don't get it that early in life, um, we should test them when it's reasonable to do the next blood draw. So similar to the recommendations of when we might check a mild hemophilia male, um, usually it's, it's early in childhood when we think we can get, you know, a not traumatic blood draw, so probably over the age of two. Um, you definitely want to get them before they're going to have a hemostatic challenge, and we want to get them before puberty because heavy menstrual bleeding really seems to be a major symptom of um, of, of uh in women who are going to end up being symptomatic with their hemophilia genetic status. So um, genetics is really going to be the only sure way to know whether or not um, she's a carrier. We, we need to know the factor levels too because they help inform our treatments. Um, but um, so my suggestion is as early as possible um, without driving us crazy, <laughs> trying to get a little kid. Great. Great. Um, next question comes in. Uh, my daughter has a factor eight level of 30 and genetic tests didn't show a known mutation. She had issues with prolonged bleeding. She's adopted, but biologically related. There's no known history of bleeding disorders in the family. What does it mean when nothing shows up on genetic testing? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. So the most likely thing is that it's probably something not in the factor eight gene. So I mean, we were able to see something in over 98% of people. So right now we're sort of weighing, do we think the low factor eight is coming from the factor eight locus or is there something else that's causing the factor eight to be low? So the most likely thing is von Willebrand factor may be, may be low or not able to bind the factor eight. So in patients where in a factor eight of 30% is certainly a level to respect, so um, my recommendation would be to consider looking for other causes starting with von Willebrand disease. Great. And this dovetails nicely into our, our next question as well, too. Um, uh, it's, it's what do we know about genotyping for VWB, VWD? I'm sorry. Is there research on that outside of my life, our future? What about other rare factor deficiencies? Yeah, great question. So My Life, Our Future really only looked at, uh, at hemophilia A and B patients. So it was only by accident that people who ended up having other bleeding disorders came in. So the first part of that is to say, you know, we should always, if things aren't making sense, we should always be suspicious that we have the right diagnosis in the first place. That's absolutely critical because it impacts all of our understanding about how things are inherited, what we think their life is gonna be like, and to make sure that we make sure that we are picking the right treatment. 
So, um, so in, in my life for future really shows that I think is that is that you know if you didn't find something in the candidate gene to rethink your diagnosis, just like what we were just talking about. Um, so uh, we, what, what my life for future was not set up for was to do um, other inherited bleeding disorders. There are other research efforts uh, going on um, in the U.S. and nationally, internationally on um, von Willebrand disease. Um, and also on rare coagulation deficiencies and better understanding the genetics of these. Um, and the von Willebrand factor gene itself, and I'm, I'm part of, um, not through my life or future, but I'm part of one, the ClinGen uh, domain uh, working group that's tackling genetic variation in von Willebrand uh, disease. Um, uh, it is my opinion that we've been underusing genetic tools in von Willebrand disease. Um, we know that it's extremely useful to, take, to uh, better understand the diagnosis of type 2 von Willebrand disease uh, to make sure we've got the right type of von Willebrand disease assigned within type 2. It can be very helpful to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 when we're having a hard time telling. Um, and it's also helpful in type 3 because the genotype predicts inhibitor risk, just like the genotype can predict inhibitor risk in hemophilia. Um, so um, uh, one challenge in von Willebrand factor gene is it's enormous. And um, most of our genetic focus has been on the middle of the gene in exon 28, um, whereas more recent data really shows very similar to what we just found in My Life, Our Future, that looking at the whole gene is important. So um, more work is happening in that area, um, there's, such as through the Zimmerman project. Um, and, um, and this is just another thing where the whole community needs to come together to do this research so that when we find genetic changes, we know what they can mean and it comes back around to inform new questions. So um, that works ongoing and um, in, with many people who are not me, um, but um, I absolutely think those are critical things to do. Um, and in order to understand that in any rare disorder, there has to be some organized infrastructure so that HTCs made my life or future possible because that network already existed. And I think leveraging those kinds of HTC networks um, could really, uh, in working with entities like NHF and Athen and having central labs that are expert in these disorders really makes it possible to think you could, this is a tractable problem. I think it's a tractable problem. These are the other uh, people I know in genetics who work in rare disorders are um, envious of, of, of how we are able to um, bring these patients and families together. So um, more information uh, related to the bleeding, more information related to levels, how is it inherited in families, um, not having this bias that women's bleeding might be unrelated um, and, and leaving them out of our studies when it's on the X chromosome. All these things um, are systematic improvements we can have um, to, to better understand. There's also people with clearly who have bleeding disorders where we haven't solved them at all. And I think genetic approaches are the right way to go um, to identify new rare disorders. Great, great, thank you, Jill. Next one is a two-part question. I'll ask the first part here. Um, discussing health equity has become an important topic. Is there a breakdown of the percent of participants related to their ethnicity in comparison to the overall population? Yes, yes, we just did that analysis. Thank you for asking. So um, uh, subjects who enrolled in My Life, Our Future were asked to, um, we, their self-identified race and ethnicity um, using the usual um, type of survey questions that are used in federal forms. Um, and we were able to take the enrollee um, self, not everybody self-identified, but most people did provide that data. And we were able to compare it to the data that was given to the CDC. Um, as you know, they are curating the data from um, hemophilia treatment centers. And uh, the, the demographics of the participants who um, in My Life or Future very, were very similar to those of, of the HTC population which looks very similar to the U.S. population. So we're hoping that that means that we're capturing a representative sample of U.S. patients. I do have concerns that it's not equitable, um, and particularly when you add in socioeconomic barriers, which we don't know about. And it is biased against females. There are way fewer females than you would expect using the ratios we discussed earlier, where we should be seeing 1.5 females for males. At the most of the HTC hemophilia population is male. Um, and then different than the US population is biased towards pediatrics, but we see it's, it's very similar in my life or future to the, the CDC data. 
So I think we've done probably as best as we can using the HTC network. And I think to improve that would be improving who has access to HTCs and specialty clinics. Great. And the second part to that question actually dovetails nicely into what you just said. Um, also on health equity was Mylofar Future Primary done in larger HTCs located in those uh, metropolitan areas, or was there an effort to include those rural areas? There was a major effort to include any HTC that wanted to come. We had 106 HTCs participate, which is almost it's the vast majority of HTCs. And some people only sent a couple patients and some people sent many patients. Um, and um, and I, I don't actually know um, what percentage of any hemophilia um, uh, population was captured at any HTC site, but my overall impression has been talking to people at small and large and rural and metropolitan and academic and standalone HTCs is that um, it was the engagement of the, of the PIs and the staff that made it work. And it, and it feels like it, it, it appears to me from what we, what we saw in accrual is that um, once the sites got activated, they participated as well as anyone could have hoped regardless of their setting. Great, great. Yeah, maybe, maybe Jill, I can add to that from one experience in Chicago. Once we had the study opened, we offered this to everybody who was eligible to participate and the, the uptake was actually quite good. So it was, it was a real, it was a tremendous opportunity for patients in the community to have their genotype uh, performed. So I think they saw that as a, as a unique opportunity. Great. A couple more questions that have come in. Um, what impact do you believe would be made by changing the nomenclature from carrier to women with hemophilia? Do you believe this would make an impact on treatment and care once diagnosed correctly? So I don't know what to call it. I mean, it, I, I, I use women with hemophilia whenever I can, um, but I have a challenge with women where the factor levels are, are technically normal, but I believe they're having hemophilia associated bleeding. So I, I, um, I know there's an ISTH committee on this naming convention, but what I do think we have to get away from using carrier. Um, I, I started calling them heterozygotes. I don't know, that's because I'm a geneticist and I, it's a very accurate and clinically supportable um, diagnosis. Um, but um, it, I think carrier gets in the way. And I think carrier gets in the way for lots of reasons because the medical community hears no disease, you know, that she shouldn't be asymptomatic. I, I've had a patient who was in the ICU with massive bleeding, needing massive transfusion. And at that time she was told she couldn't be having excessive bleeding <laughs> because she was female. Um, clearly she was. And, um, and so that kind of bias is really hard. This idea that it's a male disorder and carrier perpetuates the idea that, that females are not having bleeding. Um, and I think it gets in the way from, from uh, describing their diagnosis to getting, to getting them the treatment they need um, when they're outside and our HTC is helping from the outside to making sure insurance companies are supporting their needed care. So I think, I think carrier is just, uh, I mean, it's not, they're not a carrier of cystic fibrosis. You know, they ha can have hemophilia related bleeding and need that care. And, um, and I think that the word is getting in the way. Yeah, I think this is a, is a significant access issue, access to care, access to treatment products, et cetera. So th this is a, you know, an area of active work for NHF in terms of public policy, as well as payer relations to uh, ensure that patients, all patients with bleeding disorders have access to care, especially those as you described um, that are heterozygous for hemophilia. A couple more questions. Oh, come in. oh, I'm sorry, Joe. A couple more questions have come in. Um, how can you have a conversation with your insurance company to cover genetic testing? And I don't know if you wanted to weigh on that as, as weigh on that one as well, Lynn. Yeah, I have conversations with insurance companies all the time. Um, <laughs> so they're pretty they're pretty predictable. Um, I mean, they're incentivized to say no, right? I mean, I think we can all admit that that the incentive is to not need to pay for this test. Um, and so there's a couple of things that you can, we have a checklist basically in our clinic um, that, and, and I'll probably forget something, but includes things like, you know, to establish the diagnosis, to inform the treatment, to inform reproductive planning, to inform family testing and counseling, 
and, and any of those boxes are, are likely applicable and support the need for genetic testing. Um, and that includes um, testing even when the familial variant is known. We have examples where people in, uh, actually acquired other genetic changes or inherited another, co another causative gene on the other chromosome. Everyone deserves their own genotype. Um, and, so, um, and so it really requires, I mean, the patients sure can try and fight it, but I think it's up to us providers to fight this fight um, to make sure that the patients are getting the testing they need. And we won't succeed every time. Um, you know, there are new genotyping efforts underway now, um, but, um, but overall access to the appropriate genetic testing and also those are a fight for factor levels sometimes, even that, that you got the genetic test that you somehow have to fight for the factor level. So I think um, the patients shouldn't bear the brunt of having to do that. We as providers are supposed to be um, fighting this fight. And the more we need to get policy around this, I do think this is something where MASAC could help or another entity um, around um, what is the necessity uh, that justifies that we have these data because we really can't make the diagnosis without it and we can't inform the treatment without it and we can't possibly know what's the reproductive and family risk without it. Yeah, this is, this is a really important area where I think the, even the, the couple you know, vignettes that you shared about patients that had excessive bleeding and the challenges that they had, this is where we need to move from what's termed rescue care to healthcare. And we need to you know, ensure wellness for people. And genetic testing is one of those opportunities to uh, create wellness for people by giving them more information, empowering them to uh, ensure that they have the best possible quality of life. You know, the, the, the whole idea is so that people and families with bleeding disorders can thrive. And without this type of information, including genetic testing, that becomes a challenge uh, to their quality of life. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions that have come in. I know we're at the top of the hour, so if you don't mind us keeping you for a couple of minutes, Jill, that'd be great. Um, will My Life, Our Future do a second phase of recruiting to focus more on females? If, if anyone would make this possible, I would love it. I mean, we need this. Um, I, I, and we know, um, I mean, so I was in the central lab and I saw the racks fill up with all the samples of all the people desperately trying to make it in before the cutoff in December of 2017. And our lab fielded the calls that really wanted testing after that. And it was, it was hard to stop um, because we knew we weren't done. So yeah. <laughs> I hope so. I'm not aware of a plan like that. And maybe it isn't called My Life, Our Future, or maybe it is, um, but something's needed. And I think as uh, all the stakeholders, um, I hope that this is part of, um, I know the NHF is working on this um, state of the science. And I hope that these are part of the conversations that come from this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's unfortunate that the My Life, Our Future project of collecting samples and data has come to an end, but certainly not the analysis of the data and the samples. And that's really the rich resource that we have. Uh, and there was just a second call for proposals uh, for the My Life, Our Future data and sample analysis. And I think that's really where the value of this is now. But you know, as, as the research state of the science yeah. progresses, this is really an area that potentially could be uh, really important to, to create uh, you know, more information around the health of especially women with bleeding disorders. And that's all bleeding disorders, not just hemophilia. I completely agree. And I think um, the work we're doing that we're, that we're now that the research repository is starting to be able to be um, worked in, um, what we learn from that will make better informed questions and choices for the next whatever the name of it's going to be um, that is done to help the bleeding disorder community. Um, because, you know, we certainly thought we knew a lot going into My Life, Our Future in 2012. Um, and um, certainly I now question things that I held, <laughs> deeply held beliefs going into that now. So I think the, the experience of My Life, Our Future, um, there are many pieces of, of how that program operated to, um, to become such a successful large program that can inform future work and also, you know, the scientific findings, um, making sure that we're asking new uh, evidence-based questions. Great. And the last question that came in, 
Um, can you explain the difference between a regular factor assay and a chromogenic assay? My wife's chromogenic was in the low 30s and her hematologist said there is a big difference between the two. While she doesn't have bleeding problems, her HTC classified her as having hemophilia, which is a very different tone compared to previous non-HTC hematologists that she has visited. Yes, um, so first of all, kudos to the HTC. Um, yes, so there are two different main ways that factor activity levels are measured. And um, at, in sort of a high level, um, what you're doing in an activity assay is you're taking you know, plasma, the liquid component of blood that has all the clotting factors in it, but if you have a deficiency of kind of missing that one piece, and what you're doing is you're sort of tricking it into making a clot under controlled conditions. And then we have a readout of whether or not it, it propagated coagulation. So it's really artificial because it's all happening in a test tube and we're doing it under with activators and adding calcium back and all these things. And one thing that's really different between the two is how we activate the clot in the tube and what kinds of um, molecules are available to help with that activation. And, and then the readout is a little bit different. And so the differences between the one stage, which is sort of the usual factor eight, and the chromogenic factor eight assay are that, um, that there are changes in the factor eight molecule that seem to be different. So we know that genotypes, some genotypes can really cause a difference between the result you see in the factor eight one stage and the chromogenic. And it's almost certainly because of the way it's interacting with the activators. Now, like in our body, we have all those possibilities for activation. So the test tube is kind of eliciting this sort of artifactual difference in how the factor eight works. And the problem is that's the number we have for the level. So clearly if you have two activity levels that one comes out at like, I don't know, 55 or something, and then the other one comes out at 30. Well, now, which one do we use to predict bleeding? Most of the time, the lower one stage, um, I mean, the lower uh, chromogenic uh, correlates better with bleeding, um, but not always. So we often take the chromogenic as sort of the real activity level, but the genotype really looks like it probably correlates with this in males. And one of the questions we wanna ask in my life or future is, is that also true in females? Because I don't actually fully know how to interpret her level with regards to her risk of bleeding, but as a hematologist who hasn't met her and doesn't actually know her very well, but I would accept that a 30% factor level might be reasonable because a 30% male um, uh, doesn't have a lot of bleeding, but can have provoked bleeding. And then I would add a little bit on top of that because I would say, well, I know females levels don't really predict very well. So I would say she has a risk of bleeding. Um, so um, great that they tested her with this other method. Uh, what to do with interpreting those data is a lot harder. And uh, hopefully we'll get more answers from doing my life or future research work. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson for joining us today. I appreciate you taking the time to do so. Yeah. Um, we appreciate your expertise, and I'd also like to thank each and every one of you for joining us. Uh, please note that this recorded webinar will be available on Friday, March 19th at hemophilia.org under the Events tab with all of our other archived webinars. Also available in the Events tab is our upcoming schedule for our weekly web Wednesday webinar series. Thank you again, Jill, and have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you.